Next up, we're going to introduce Tyrone Dunbar, who, as I said before, he's the manager of Urban Climate Services at the Met Office. Um, Tyrone assists with running the science programme. He's been heavily involved in communicating the scientific research carried out at the Met Office. And before that, Tyrone was awarded a PhD in atmospheric science from the Department of Meteorology at the University of Reading. Thank you, Tyrone. Okay, thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Um, and you've just reminded me that I need to, I need to update my, my web page because I'm not actually the manager of uh, Urban Climate Services anymore. So hopefully these are my slides. So yeah, so I've actually changed jobs recently. I'm now the Climate Knowledge Integration Manager at the Met Office. So um, my new position is uh, really acting as, uh, leading a team rather that acts as a go-between between between the UK government and the Met Office and the climate research that we do. So my role is really about translating and communicating climate science, the type of work that goes on at the Met Office and trying to turn that into the usable information for the UK government and for policymakers, and also for the public and for, for the private sector, so the likes of yourselves. Um, so I was delighted to uh, get the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, I have to admit, when I first got the, the invite to, to talk at a, a conference for, for people involved in convincing, I didn't quite make the link between climate change and convincing, but having spoken with people over the last few weeks, I can see that it's actually a really important role that you all play, and the, the role of law uh, in, in how we adapt and become resilient to climate change is really vital. So I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm delighted to get a chance to, to speak, and I'm really pleased that not too much of my talk overlaps with Roger, so I was slightly worried that he would cover uh, some of the things I was going to talk about. There are a couple of overlaps that we'll, we'll, we'll get to. Um, and also, normally as the, the climate scientist who speaks at these events, I tend to be the, the doom and gloom act, so I tend to be the one who brings all the bad news. And yeah, thank you, Roger, you, you've broken some of the bad news already, which is, which is nice, but yeah, you, you give us a, a nice story at the end. So I will start uh, with uh, an image that probably many of you will have seen something like this before. So this is kind of the, 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 the standard image that all climate scientists talk, uh, start their, their presentations with. This shows the global average temperature rise that we've seen in the Earth over the last 150 years. And really what this is showing is how greenhouse gas emissions have changed the Earth's climate. So you can see uh, back 150 years ago, there were some fluctuations in the Earth's temperature these kind of red and blue lines, and then when we get into the 20th century, and especially the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century, this really incredibly rapid rise in global average temperatures. And Roger, you mentioned we're now actually at 1.2 degrees uh, warmer than we were back in the, in the 19th century. And all of this change in temperature has been driven by greenhouse gas emissions from human activity. And in fact, it's actually more than, uh, than the amount of temperature rise that we've seen because we're also emitting other pollution into the atmosphere which has a cooling effect. So actually some of the pollution that we're emitting is slightly dampening the, uh, the temperature rise that we would see from the greenhouse gases that we're emitting into the atmosphere. And temperature isn't the only aspect of this equation. As I'm sure you're aware, it's altering rainfall patterns. We're seeing sea level rise because of the, uh, the increase in energy in the, in the Earth system. It's melting uh, the ice caps. and, and very importantly, it's, it's driving changes in the extreme weather events that we're seeing. Roger already mentioned some of these in his talk. Uh, climate change and this increase in energy in the atmosphere is causing uh, extreme weather events to become more frequent and to become more intense. And so I've just got a couple of examples here of, of the major impacts that these extreme events are causing worldwide and in the UK. So I'm sure many of you remember the really awful flooding that we saw last year in July 2021. Uh, in, in Eastern Europe. So uh, really extreme weather, really extreme uh, rainfall that was driven by what we call a mesoscale convective system, which resulted in, in major uh, damaging impacts across that area and sadly over 200 deaths. And what scientists have been doing with events like these is carrying out what we call attribution, where we look at the, uh, the effect or the impact that climate change has had on these specific extreme events. So what the scientists do is they use their computer models to look at a world that doesn't have an increase in greenhouse gas emissions in it. And then we look at a world that does have the increase in greenhouse gas emissions and we compare the two. And whenever we do that comparison, we can see that events like the one that led to that really extreme damaging rainfall and flooding in Europe last summer was made 1.2 to 9 times more likely uh, because of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. And the intensity of the rainfall was between 3 and 19% higher. 
So basically, climate change, the greenhouse gas emissions that we've put into the atmosphere have made that flooding event much more likely, and they've made it more intense. And that's because that extra energy in the atmosphere is uh, increasing the amount of water, the amount of moisture that can be held by the atmosphere. So when we see these rainfall events, they're heavier, they're more intense, and they lead to more flooding. So uh, the next example is the, the North American heat wave. And Roger, you mentioned this, the, the really extreme records that were broken in, in Lytton in Canada. So if you remember, this was, this was referred to as a heat dome by the, the media in, in June 2021 when it happened last year. So it was this enormous area of high pressure that built up over the Pacific Northwest uh, of, of the United States and into Canada and really allowed the heat just to build and build and build for many weeks there. And we saw record-breaking temperatures nearly hitting 50 degrees in Canada. And as Roger mentioned, that was five degrees above the previous high temperature record, which is just unprecedented. And you kind of, you, you stole my thunder as well in this next point, Roger, where we, put, we carried out attribution statements, or studies, sorry, on this, this um, temperature record. And scientists found that it was actually nearly impossible for us to hit those record-breaking temperatures. It was just on the very edge of, of, of likeliness uh, whenever they studied those temperatures. So basically, the, again, the greenhouse gas that we've emitted into the atmosphere, it's driving these really intense heat events. And then finally, I just wanted to mention an example from the UK. Uh, so I picked a flooding example. There were lots I could have picked. Uh, so the 2018 heat wave, which many of you remember, might remember, um, was really intense in the UK, and it's been made much more likely. But I picked this uh, heavy rainfall example. So February 2020, the wettest February on record in the UK. You might remember one of the named storms that came through in that month was Storm Kira. This saw a month's worth of rain falling in parts of West Yorkshire in just 18 hours. And that led to really extreme and widespread flooding. So climate change is already affecting the UK. It's already having an impact on people's lives, people's livelihoods around the UK. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the most dangerous impacts of climate change, which remain uncertain. So we talk a lot about the trends in temperatures and the trends in rainfall and so on. But actually, some of the more worrying uh, parts of climate change are what we call tipping points or high impact, low likelihood events. And you'll probably start hearing more about these in the media because it's a real focus of the climate science research community at the moment. And governments around the world are very interested in trying to understand uh, the, these types of events. I've picked out six examples here of, of, of tipping points or, or high impact, low likelihood events. So in the top left, we've got a uh, rapid melting of the, the polar uh, land ice over Greenland or in Antarctic. So there are processes that could cause this land ice to melt much more quickly than we expect. Uh, if that happens, we could see a real increase in acceleration and sea level rise above what we're expecting at the moment. Um, Roger, again, you mentioned this deforestation of the Amazon. So that's happening because of logging. But there's also a natural tipping point which could be reached where the Amazon might become too dry and too hot for the rainforest to, to, to exist. And so the, the rainforest could die back. And that's a huge amount of carbon that's stored and is being sucked up by the Amazon rainforest, which would then be released into the atmosphere, providing another big pulse of warming greenhouse gases. Sea ice in the Arctic, in particular, is, is vanishing rapidly. Uh, so we know this well. We know that it's going to uh, disappear over the course of this century. What's less certain is exactly what impact that's going to have, particularly on the UK. There's a lot of research going on looking at how that uh, reduction of sea ice in the, in the North Pole uh, is going to affect the storm track. So how will it affect the storms that hit us uh, in the winter in the UK? Will it become wetter or drier? Uh, that's still an area of quite a lot of uncertainty. A big one for us in particular is, is changes in ocean circulation. So uh, the ocean circulation in the North Atlantic, many of you will have heard of the Gulf Stream. So it's a, a stream of warm water that comes up from the Caribbean and gives Northern Europe its, its moderate temperate climate. Because of the land ice that's melting in the, the Greenland ice sheet, that's freshening the water in the North Atlantic, and it's slowing down this ocean circulation. So we're, we're, we can see that already. It's being observed. And as that ocean circulation slows, it's bringing less of that warm water up from the Caribbean. And there, are actually, uh, there is actually evidence that that circulation has broken down completely in the past. Uh, and some climate models show that it could potentially break down again in the future. If that happens, it could be an enormous shift 
in our northern hemisphere uh, climate, we'd actually see a massive amount of cooling and real changes in the amount of rainfall we'd see, and then the southern hemisphere would see a lot of warming. Uh, permafrost, there's a huge amount of permafrost uh, in the, the, the Arctic, which is thawing, and a lot of carbon is locked up in that permafrost. So scientists are quite concerned that if this melts more quickly or thaws more quickly than we expect, it could result in a huge pulse of methane, which would accelerate warming again very rapidly. And then finally, coral reefs, which I'm sure you've all heard about bleaching of, of the coral reefs. Um, and that's where temperatures rise in sea, such that it drives out the algae and the bacteria that keep the reefs healthy. That's a, an image of a, a bleached coral reef where all the algae and the bacteria have been driven out. And you can see all the associated biodiversity is driven out as well. Um, so far, we've been quite lucky. Uh, whenever the sea temperatures drop again, the reefs seem to recover reasonably well. But that's not guaranteed for the future. And there could be a point at which the sea, level, or sea temperatures rise enough that we would permanently kill off these, the, these ecosystems. Okay, so that's some of, the, uh, some of the impacts we've seen already, and then looking forward to some of the uncertain changes we might see. And then I wanted to focus just for a, a brief slide, and I apologize, this is the most science-y slide I think I've got. I did read some social science research that said when scientists present, people expect them to give them something complicated and confusing because it makes them think they're more, uh, more professional. So I apologize for the science of this, but I'm hoping it makes you feel like I'm, I'm more of a research scientist. So this is, this is about the, um, the, the decadal climate forecast. So again, Roger mentioned this, that the Met Office recently released our decadal forecast of what we expect global temperatures to, to change over the next five years. And this caused quite a few headlines in recent weeks. Uh, because we have shown that there's, there's a chance now that we may temporarily go above that temperature uh, target of 1.5 degrees centigrade that was set in the Paris uh, Agreement. And I should highlight or I should reinforce at this point, that doesn't mean we have broken the Paris Agreement target. It just means we will temporarily overshoot that uh, 1.5 degrees. We expect we will come down after that to below 1.5 degrees again, but it's a worrying sign of where we're going. So we're definitely getting towards uh, breaching that, that 1.5 degree target, which, which Roger mentioned in his talk. So to try and briefly explain this plot, what it's showing is time along the bottom axis and, and temperature change up the, the, the y-axis, the vertical axis, and those green uh, splodges are showing previous forecasts of temperature over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, and the black line shows what actually happens, so those are observations of temperature rise. Uh, and you can see that the black line sticks roughly in the middle, or at least it's within those green plumes of the previous forecast, so we know that our, our forecast system is doing a good job. And right at the end of the, the plot is a blue plume, which shows our forecast starting in this year. And you can see that there's a real uptick at the end in the blue temperature plume. Uh, what we expect is going to happen is we're going to see a return of El Nino conditions. So you, you might have heard of El Nino. It's a, a natural phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean where the, uh, the heat in the Pacific Ocean comes to the surface and is released into the atmosphere, and it gives us a big pulse of temperature rise uh, around the world. Uh, and that is being added on top of this already continuing trend from greenhouse gases. So we expect that pulse of heat in the Pacific Ocean from El Nino is going to push us up temporarily above that 1.5 degree target. But as Roger mentioned, we still expect that we are going to get permanently or, or at least uh, more consistently above that 1.5 degree level uh, in the near future. OK, so this next section, what I was hoping to do and what the, the organizers asked me to do was to, to show uh, a weather forecast which the Met Office produced. Uh, so we have this wonderful YouTube video. It's got one of our professional broadcast meteorologists um, presenting what a, a forecast might look like for the UK in 2050. Now, the bad news is I couldn't get the video to embed within my presentation. So what I'm going to have to do is my best broadcast meteorologist impression and try and talk you through the forecast myself. So you've had Roger reading the news. You're not going to have me giving you a weather forecast for, for 2050. So this is based on a, a Met Office climate projection. So it's based on a plausible, uh, feasible uh, climate simulation of what the weather in the UK might look like in 2050. And this is during a heat wave event. So, OK. Hello, it's Friday, 22nd of July, 2050. We're now on day nine of this really extreme heat wave conditions that have, that have covered the UK because of the high pressure over Europe 
for, uh, for the last week or so. It's been again an extremely hot day with temperatures reaching the high 30s across the whole of the country. But there is good news in the horizon because we are hoping to see a return to slightly cooler conditions next week. So just looking at conditions today, you can see that we hit a high of 43 degrees in Worcester and actually we hit high, uh, low 40 temperatures in many cities across the Midlands of the UK and into the south. So hitting 40 degrees in Birmingham and Southampton. Uh, and across the rest of the country, consistently hitting temperatures of high 30s in Northern Ireland hitting 35, and in Scotland hitting highs of up to 38 degrees. So an extremely hot day. And unfortunately, the high temperatures are going to continue into the night, and we're going to get very little respite. So consistently across the UK, we're going to see temperatures of around 20 degrees and above 20 degrees, with a high of about 24 in London. It's going to be a very hot, very uncomfortable night. And because of these consistent high temperature conditions, there is an ongoing red warning for heat health across the UK. So please look out for any vulnerable members of your, your family or your community. Make sure you drink plenty of fluids. Make sure you stay in the shade. Keep your windows open at night if you can. The reason that we've got these extremely high temperatures across the UK are because of this persistent high pressure system sitting over Scandinavia, which is bringing in extremely warm air across the, the continent and up over the UK. And this is on top of the already high temperatures that we're seeing because of climate change over the last 150 years. But good news is on the horizon. There's a low pressure building in the Atlantic, and we expect that to move across the North Atlantic over the weekend and hit the UK at the beginning of next week. And that's going to bring some relief and respite to these heat wave conditions, and we'll return to usual summer temperatures in the high 20s by the uh, beginning to the middle of next week. But looking forward into the next few days over the weekend, tomorrow, Saturday the 23rd of July, we're going to continue to see these high temperatures. That extreme heat is going to shift slightly to the west into Wales. We're going to continue seeing high temperatures in the low 40s across the southwest of the UK and into the Midlands and into Wales, consistently across the rest of the country. We're going to see temperatures in the high 30s and even hitting 30 degrees and above in Northern Ireland, where I'm from. That is unheard of near Belfast. So that's a, that's a kind of a, an, an idea of what a forecast might look like in the future uh, based on a, a climate change simulation produced by the Met Office. I should also add that this climate change simulation in the run-up to these heat wave conditions that were seen in the model was extremely dry. So not only would we see heat wave conditions, this would be an extremely, uh, extremely high drought condition as well across the UK. So for my last couple of slides, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about specific impacts that I think will be relevant to you uh, uh, in terms of uh, importance for, for properties and other infrastructure and buildings across the UK. So I've just picked out three particular impacts in the UK that I think are important. So heat stress on buildings, uh, flooding, which is obviously a really major impact that you see for, for buildings and properties, and also drought conditions, which can lead to subsidence. I could have also talked about sea level rise in this slide and, and issues around coastal erosion, and I didn't quite have the chance or couldn't quite find the room to, to fit that in. But I wanted to show you some relatively recent research that came out last year from the Met Office, where we've been using some of our state-of-the-art climate modeling to look at uh, impact metrics uh, across the UK. So starting in the top left, looking at heat stress, what I've picked out here is a plot that shows days above 25 degrees centigrade per, uh, per year. So these plots show maps which show you how many days in the year are going to be above 25 degrees centigrade. 25 degrees centigrade is picked because that's the point at which we start to see health impacts uh, across the UK. And what these plots show, what these maps show on the left-hand side are observations from the recent past. And then the next three maps show uh, how that metric will change when we've got 1.5 degrees of warming, 2 degrees of global warming, and 4 degrees of global warming. So it's not showing the timing of when this will happen, but what happens at those levels of warming. And you can see, as you might expect, as we get to warmer le or higher levels of global warming, we see an increase in the number of days that get above 25 degrees centigrade per year. So just to pick the most extreme example, if we got to 4 degrees of global warming, you can see a really huge increase in the number of days above 25 degrees per year in the southeast of England, stretching into the Midlands and up the east coast and down into the southwest and into Wales as well, actually. Um, and if you can read the scale on the side, what we would be seeing is 80 days or more 
uh, of the year would be above 25 degrees centigrade. So that's effectively saying that the, pretty much the whole of the summer would be above 25 degrees centigrade every day. Um, looking back to what we're seeing at the moment, it's typically more between 20 and 30 days that get above 25 degrees. So that's a real increase in the number of very hot days that we're seeing. Looking in the rest of the country, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, if we hit four degrees of warming, we would start to see uh, summertime conditions more similar to what we see in the southeast of England today. So Northern Ireland and Scotland would really have to, to, to you know, cold countries would have to change the way they think about their infrastructure. Looking at drought in the, the bottom left-hand side of the slide, so this is a, a metric that looks at the rainfall deficit over a 12-month period. It's complicated, but basically what this is showing is the intensity of droughts, so it's not showing the likelihood of how the droughts might change. Uh, but if there is a drought that occurs, how intense it might be. And what you can see, so again, the, the, the maps correspond to the ones above with the observations on the left-hand side. And just looking again at the four-degree rise world, so the extreme climate change world, you can see a real intensification of the likely droughts or of the droughts that we might see. So when a drought occurs in that world, it will be much more intense. That's spread much more geographically across the UK, although actually not down the, uh, the west coast of Scotland, which only sees a moderate change in the intensity of droughts. And I'm guessing that's because of the storm tracks that still bring wet weather into the west coast of, of Scotland. And finally, just looking at rainfall changes. So these uh, maps that I showed on the, the right-hand slide as you're, as you're viewing uh, the slide, so presented in slightly different ways. So this is looking at uh, the change in rainfall as, as a percentage uh, in 2060 to 2079, so sort of after the middle of the century for a relatively high greenhouse gas emissions scenario. Uh, and the way it's presented here is the middle of those maps shows the average of what we expect to see and then a low extreme and a high extreme on either side. And just focusing on the middle map that it's showing, you can see that consistently across pretty much the whole of the UK, we expect to see a 20 to 30% increase in the amount of rainfall seen across the country. Uh, but if we look at the extreme case, you can see some more geographical changes coming in there, particularly around the coast of Scotland, where you're seeing up to a 40 to 50% increase in the, the amount of rainfall that we could see in that area. And also in the south of the UK, and particularly around the, the south coast, there's a, a, a high change or high percentage increase in the amount of rainfall that they might see. And I should point out that's a percentage change. So obviously it's a percentage change between a wet Scotland, already very wet, uh, and, and the south coast, which is quite dry in, in comparison. So moving on to my final slide, I just wanted to, to give you a, a quick uh, preview of some exciting work that's coming out of the Met Office that I think is relevant to, to, to you uh, in terms of property. So this is a piece of work that the Met Office is doing. So we work around the UK with people to help prepare them for the impacts of climate change. Uh, so this is harking back to my previous job working on urban climate change, uh, where we were doing a project with Bristol City Council working with them to look at uh, city-scale uh, heat stress within the city. And we were using a new state-of-the-art, very high-resolution climate model. The great thing about these new climate change projections or simulations we're using is that we could actually use them to zoom in to uh, an electoral ward level of detail across the city. So you can see Bristol here with the electoral wards mapped out. And this plot is showing, um, again, the same metric as I showed in the previous one. It's days that get above 25 degrees centigrade and you can see the recent past, uh, the near-term future, and then the end of the century. I've actually taken the, the scale off these just because it's quite new research, uh, so I didn't, want to, I didn't want to include the actual details. But you can see by the colors that this real intense change of the number of days getting above 25 degrees. But what's really interesting for the city councils is that this climate model is so detailed, it picks up the effect of urbanization within the cities. So those areas that are much more built up, that have a lot more concrete, a lot more buildings, are much hotter and they see much more extreme uh, heat stress impacts compared to other parts of the, the city, the more leafy suburbs that have more green spaces, they're slightly cooler. And so this information is helping cities around the UK to plan for how they might uh, mitigate those impacts of extreme heat. And as I said, we're working with Bristol City Council and this type of information is feeding into the city's adaptation plan, the Heat Resilient Bristol Plan. Okay, I think I've probably gone over my 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll finish here. Uh, and, and say thank you very much for uh, for having me.